I feel like we're in the movies. This is take four. <laughs> of course, if we were in the movies, we would have technical people to make sure that this was all working. But because we're in quarantine, we don't have anyone to um, help me with this except over the phone. So it's been a little bit of a postponement. So I'm going to start again, and hopefully this time it's working. Um, welcome to the virtual New York State Museum. We are doing these Facebook Live events to try to bring you information from the museum because no one can visit right now. I'm Dr. Lisa Amati, and I am the State Paleontologist of New York, and I curate the paleontology collection at the New York State Museum. Today's topic is fossil or fake, and I was able to bring some fossils home to share with you guys. Now, normally we don't bring fossils out of the museum. Normally they are kept under lock and key and you have to make an appointment to see them. But these are fossils that are part of our teaching collection. So these are fossils that can leave the museum, they can be handled by people, I can even take them home to do things like this. So today I'm gonna show you some fossils talk a little bit about what is and isn't a fossil, and go over some different types of fossilization. First, before we do that, we should talk about what is a fossil. A fossil is any evidence of ancient life, okay? So it's evidence that there was a living thing there and it has to be ancient. Some fossils are very obvious, things like this shark tooth here, move it forward a little bit. There's a, a nice pretty shark tooth that's been fossilized. And this is obviously evidence of life because it was once part of a shark. And it's also ancient, so that, that's an easy one. Then there are fossils that aren't quite so obvious. Things like dinosaur footprints are considered fossils because they're ancient and they tell us that there was a living thing there. Also, um, everybody's favorite fossil poop poop is also a fossil. It tells us something about the organism that was alive. We can saw through the fossil poop and look for bones in it or fragments of plants to tell what the animal ate. Okay, um, I want to talk just for a minute, about, a minute about trace fossils. Trace fossils are fossils that are left behind, traces left behind of a living thing. So here's one right here. This one's really cool. It's called Russophycus. And if you can see, there are these little lines going across the fossil. And those are where a trilobite, which I'll show you later, used its legs to dig itself down into the mud and made a little burrow to hide in. So this is an example of a trace of an ancient animal or a trace fossil. When you mention fossils, most people think of dinosaurs, and dinosaurs are awesome, trust me, I love dinosaurs, I have dinosaur t-shirts and dinosaur toys, but when it comes to the fossil record, most fossils are not fossils of dinosaurs. Most fossils are fossils of invertebrate organisms. And those are just animals that didn't have a backbone. In places like New York, you're much more likely to find a snail shell or a clam shell preserved as a fossil than you are to find a dinosaur bone. And that's because New York was once covered by these very widespread seas or oceans. They weren't very deep, but tons of animals lived in them and became fossilized. Another type of fossil that's really important from New York is our fossil plants. We have some of the oldest known forests anywhere in the world right here in New York State. So let's look at some fossils and see how we can tell if it's actually a fossil. And we'll start with this piece of dinosaur bone. This is from Utah. Let me get, get it so that you can see it up against my dark blue shirt and move it closer. Okay, that's a piece of dinosaur bone. Doesn't look like much, does it? So how do I know this is a piece of dinosaur bone? Well, bone, when it's fossilized, will look a lot like modern bone. Oftentimes there will be a smooth outer surface and then the inner surface will have pores in it or openings in it where the bone marrow was. Okay, so it's gonna look a lot like a piece of chicken bone. 
How do you tell if it's a fossil? For example, when I was uh, younger, still going to college, I went on a fossil dinosaur dig in Montana. And there were a ton of deer bones laying around where coyotes have had a meal. And it was a little hard sometimes to tell, is this a scrap of dinosaur bone is, or is it a scrap of deer bone? So we use the ever popular tongue test. All you have to do is uh, uh, hung. Uh, yeah, it sticks. That tells you it's been fossilized. Now, the unfortunate part is when you take one of those modern deer bones and stick that to your tongue, and you're like, yeah, this doesn't stick. And I just licked a part of a carcass. But that doesn't happen very often. Usually you can tell. Okay. So that was a dinosaur bone. Now let's look at some fossils like you're more likely to find in most places. Um, the first thing you should do when you're looking for fossils is try to look at the rocks that are around you. Fossils are almost always found in sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are layered. So here's one right here. You can see that it has this kind of thin layered appearance. And it's not showing up really great, but this is actually a very red rock, kind of, well, kind of orange. This was deposited on land, and we know it was deposited on land because of the red color. When rocks form, they usually have a little bit of iron in them, and air has more oxygen in it than water does, so the iron is more likely to rust, turning it red. If the sedimentary rocks are red, you can look for footprints and you can look for fossil plants. If the sedimentary rocks are other colors, like this kind of tan one here and those white bits, uh, this is very confusing because it's a mirror image. There we go. There are these white bits here. These are all pieces of fossil. And we have another rock here. Here's another sedimentary rock. These are not red. These contain fossils of animals that lived in the oceans. So let's take a look at the first specimen after the dinosaur bone. We have the shell. It's a very pretty shell. It's coiled. And it has this little opening right here. So this is a snail shell. Notice that it is very shiny. It is smooth and it still has the original color. This is not a fossil. This is, first of all, not altered. It's in its original condition. It hasn't been changed at all. And it's not very old. So let's look at this one. This one's a little harder to see because it's such a bright color. It's very, very white. But it feels chalky when I touch it. None of the original color is there, and it's not as shiny. This snail shell has been altered. It has been changed from what it was made of when the animal was alive. So it's been fossilized. In this case, it was recrystallized. The mineral that the original shell was made of has changed into another mineral. It has changed its shape. So that is not only ancient, it has been altered. Here's one from New York. This one's called either Platycerus or Platycerus. It depends on how you want to pronounce it. Nice little coiled snail. It's about 350 million years old. Okay, let's move on to the snail's near relatives, the bivalves or clams. Here is a clam shell. Well, it's not actually a clam shell. It's a clam fossil. I'm gonna try not to drop it on my keyboard. You can see that it has this clam shape, but you don't see any surface features. It's very, very smooth. And that's because this is actually an internal mold of a clam. What happened was the clam shell was open, mud got into it, and filled up the inside of the shell, and then the shell dissolved away. So it's still a fossil, it's a fossil of a clam, but the shell is no longer there. Here's a clam shell from New York. You'll notice that it's a little crooked looking. So it's, I, I'm having trouble with the mirror image. <laughs> it's kind of fatter right here than it is on the other side. 
So basically, if you were to take this and you were to cut it in half and fold it over, the two sides would not match each other. And that's how you tell if it's a bivalve instead of our next fossil, a brachiopod. Notice that the brachiopod, if I were to cut this in half and fold it over, the two sides would match each other. So the way to tell a brachiopod from a bivalve is brachiopods, the two sides of the shell match each other, and in bivalves, they don't. Now, this is also a really interesting fossil because it's about 350 million years old, but it is essentially unaltered. It is still made of the same mineral that it was made of when the brachiopod was alive. Still qualifies as a fossil, but kind of neat that it is, it's still made of what it was when the animal was alive. Our next group is also related to snails and clams. I'm going to show you some cephalopods. Cephalopods are things like squids, octopuses, cuttlefish, and the chambered nautilus. The chambered nautilus has a big coiled shell, kind of looks a little bit like a snail shell, but it doesn't coil up. And the little tentacles stick out the front of the shell. They're very rare in today's oceans, but in the past, most cephalopods had a big hard coiled outer shell. So I'm going to show you a little guy right now. See how it's coiled. And it also has kind of a gold, ooh, there you can see the gold color. See the gold color to it? This fossil actually used to be made of one mineral and now is made of the mineral pyrite. Pyrite is also known as fool's gold because it fools people into thinking they just found something that's worth a lot of money when it actually isn't. Let's see, what else did I want to tell you about? Oh, corals. Here's a beautiful coral right here. Notice that you can see all these walls on the inside of the coral, beautifully preserved, very fragile little walls on the skeleton. This coral used to be made of one mineral and it was replaced by another mineral called silica or quartz. When that happens, very fine detail, like these little walls in the fossil coral, they can be preserved really, really in great relief and detail. Okay, so far we've been looking at animals that have shells that are made of one piece, like the snail, sorry, my dog is trying to help me. They're made of one piece, like the snail shell, or they're made of two pieces, like the bivalve or clam shells. But some animals have their body parts made of many, many pieces, and those pieces are all held together by fine membranes. So what happens is when the animal dies, the fossil breaks apart, or the animal body breaks apart into a million pieces, and all those pieces can end up being found separately. So you're only finding little bits and pieces of the whole fossil. A crinoid is a good example of this. So this is a crinoid. These are extinct. There are modern crinoids, but they look quite a bit different from this one. If you want to look up information about crinoids, they can also be called sea lilies. Crinoids are made up of a number of parts or elements. These little um, discs that you see right here are kind of like Cheerios. So they're like little Cheerios stacked up together. And then there are a bunch of plates that make up the body and those are held together very weakly. And then a bunch more Cheerios stacked up together to make the arms. So all those little Cheerios are held together by membranes. Usually when these animals die, they fall apart and you might find something like this. Uh, it's, you know, a little less exciting than the whole thing. This one was found in Indiana, Indiana, yeah, and it basically died and then was buried before it could become scattered into pieces. We have really stunning crinoids that are from New York, but unfortunately, none of them are in the teaching collection. Let's see, what am I forgetting? 
kidding. Oh yeah, trilobites. I would never forget trilobites. So trilobites are another animal that are made up of many different parts. They have a head section right here and then two cheeks that can fall off after the animal dies. Then they have all these segments down the middle part of the body, all of these separate segments down the middle part of the body, and then a tail. The good thing about this is that it makes them able to flex and move so that when they're moving around on an ancient reef, they have a lot more mobility. It makes us a little bit unhappy because usually when you find fossil trilobites, they're in pieces. So here's one from New York. Yeah, doesn't look like much, does it? But there's the tail right there. You can see a bunch of segments here. And then, oop, the head is gone. So finding a whole trilobite actually isn't that easy. I studied trilobites myself, and I've only found a few. And I started finding them when I was about five. So, yeah, kind of rough when you're trying to find a whole trilobite. But they do exist. Here's another one from New York. It's a dark trilobite on a dark rock, so not super easy to see. You notice that they're usually found encased in rock. But every once in a while you find one that is not. Here's a little trilobite. These are his eyes right here. And we're gonna keep rolling him around. There's his whole head. There are his segments of the middle part of the body and if we keep going we will find there it is the tail so notice that this little guy is rolled up and rolled up into a ball and that's to protect them from predators it's very hard for a predator to bite through this hard exoskeleton with and they're protected on the inside trilobites have been extinct for about 250 million years but they were very important when they did live and their fossils can be found in all sorts of places across North America. But remember, you're not looking for the whole thing. Usually you, you need to look for just the head or just the tail or just the middle parts, and then you're more likely to find one. So those are all the fossils that I brought home to show you guys today. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about fossils and hopefully we'll be back soon, either in person or online to tell you guys more about our specimens at the New York State Museum. Thanks again for turning in, tuning in.